Hello, my name is Matilda Jocelyn Gage, and I was a suffragette, but maybe you didn't hear about me. I don't think you could find me in this museum. But there's a reason for that, and we'll get to that. It's not why I came. I didn't come back in history to, to give you a history lesson. I came back to, to tell you why I did it why I fought so long and hard and what I wanted for my children and how long it took me to get it. Well, I got to start at the beginning. I was born in 1856. That was before the Civil War. But my parents were progressive. They sent me to school. They wanted me to be a free thinker. My father was a physician and an abolitionist. And when I grew up, I wanted to be that too. But women couldn't go to a university and learn how to be a doctor. That was unheard of. So instead, I got married at 17. That wasn't young then. And I married Henry Gage, and it was a good match. Henry was nine years old. Um, older than me. He already had a business and he was pretty tied up in it, so I had a lot of free time and a generous allowance. Henry let me do whatever I wanted. Huh. Although he did get a little upset that time, I was um, accused of using our home as part of the Underground Railroad. We had to pay a big fine, or else I would have had to spend six months in jail. But I always worked for the downtrodden. I, I did fight for the uh, African Americans. I even went out west and fought for the Native Americans. And they had a special name for me, but I don't remember it anymore. It doesn't matter. Things I didn't hold with was temperance. I thought that was a bad idea from the beginning. And history has proved me right about that. <sighs> and I took on the churches. Now understand, I was a religious woman and went to church my whole life. But I was not going to sit there and have the minister say to me that women were intrinsically sinful and immoral and had to be obedient to their husbands in every way. No. I wasn't going to stand for that. What I really, really, really wanted was the right to vote so that women could go to university and become a doctor or a lawyer or a scientist, like what was denied to me. And so I fought long and hard. And by the time my daughter Julia was 18, women could go to Syracuse. Oh, it was the happiest day of my life. I packed her trunk, and I got her father to get her on the train and get her up there. And But it was a mistake. Julio was raised in the Victorian age. We did everything for her. She didn't have to make any decisions except maybe what ribbon matched her dress. She didn't know how to be independent. And she was shy and, and plain and kind of nervous. She stuck it out two years, and then she got sick. And then she refused to go back. I was so disappointed. She gave up the chance to go to university to be, to be whatever she wanted. She gave it up. But she was my daughter. I loved her. It took me a while to get over it. And I said, well, you want to live the secure, nice, quiet life? You can stay home and take care of my household duties, take them all on, and that'll just give me more free time to go out and fight for the women who did want to go to university. And that's what I did. 
I went out there. I was the youngest woman at 26 to speak at a women's democratic conference. I love to do research and write. I wrote maybe 12 books and countless pamphlets. I was the main writer of the Women's Declaration of Independence, and I walked up on the stage where the vice president was speaking and handed it to him. You try that today and see how far you get. I defended Susan B. Anthony in her trial where she got arrested for trying to vote. And even the men said that I was very logical and did a good job. Over the years, I was president and vice president of oh, so many organizations. But then things changed. Susan thought that the organization, the movement, should, should be more conservative. She wanted, she wanted to get on, on the good side of the temperance movement, and, and she wanted the churches to help out. She thought that I was too radical, radical, because I said things. I said things, and I'm quoted all the time for saying, Sometimes it's better to be a dead man than a live woman. And that was true. It was true. If you didn't have a marriage like I did, once you married, you lost all your independence. Your husband didn't have to give you a penny. He could dictate where you could go, when you could, how long you could stay there, and what time you had to be back. He could leave in his will the children to somebody else. And even if he had a large fortune and he was worried about having to divvy it up too much, he could force you to have a, an abortion. And abortions back then weren't pretty. So I was not going to be conservative, no. I started my own movement. I got my own newspaper. And I went ahead with it. And consequently, I'm not in this museum because they started to write me out of history. They left me out. But I was remembered for one thing. It's called the Matilda Effect. I fought for women to get credit for their scientific discoveries and that cotton gin well, Mrs. Greenleaf had a lot to do with it. Did she get any credit? No. So today, when a woman doesn't get credit for her scientific discoveries, they call that the Matilda effect. And I know I'm remembered because there's a woman from your time. Her name was uh, Gloria Steinman. And you know what she said about me? She said, I was born ahead of my time. I didn't want to get into all that. But, you know, I had another daughter, 10 years younger than Julia. Her name was Maud, and I made sure she grew up independent. I sent her to a boys' school. And when she was 18, she was ready for college. Oh, she was. She wanted to, to learn and ask questions and debate and argue. She couldn't wait. She packed her own trunk, and she threatened to go up on the train herself. But that would be unheard of. Her father took her. And, and Cornell, well, it was ready for her, at least sort of. They built a college called Sage College for Women. It was only five years old when Maud went there. It was three stories tall. It had a water closet on every floor. It had common rooms that were beautifully appointed with oriental rugs and furniture and grand pianos. There was a, an infirmary if you got sick. And in the basement, I never heard of this, an in-ground swimming pool so that the ladies could get their exercise. You see, men donated this um, college because they said if a woman lost her husband 
what would she do? She could be a teacher. Well, at the time Maud went there, there were 19 students. The building could hold 200, but there were only 19 ladies there. And why? Because parents were raising their Victorian daughters to be pure lilies, beautiful flowers that a man would come by and see and, and want to take home to stand beside him and show off. If a woman went to college, well, she might say things. She might be outspoken. She might challenge him. It wouldn't be a good idea to have your daughter with an education. She'd never find a husband. <laughs> there were a few parents who took the opposite viewpoint. Send your daughter to Sage College because there were hundreds of men around, all wealthy, all with educations. Surely they would find a husband. And so my dear Maud entered the dining room that first night. It was, a, it was kind of like an ante room where there was somebody playing the piano and the gentleman and the lady stood around in polite conversation waiting to be invited into dinner. And Maud was so happy She twirled, twirled, you know, spun around. She only did it one time. And one of the gentlemen, I won't call him a gentleman, yelled out, hey, we got a lively one. Now, you might think lively isn't a bad adjective. A lively girl today would be a catch. But lively had a different meaning back then. Lively meant that you might be lively when it came to things that nice young women didn't do. Maud's roommate pulled her aside and said, Don't, you know, it's like ladies are seen and not heard. Don't do that. But it was too late. Part of it was my fault because it didn't take long for them to figure out who her mother was. And that's when the bullying started. They sang underneath her window. They clapped when she entered the room. It was really hard. She did meet one young man who liked to listen to her and wanted to hear her ideas. He wasn't a college student. He, I think he just lived in the town, but his name was Frank Baum. And uh, they hit it off, and it wasn't long before Frank asked um, Maud if she would ask us for permission to court her. And Maud said she was sorry. She couldn't do that because she had promised me that she wouldn't consider marriage until she graduated. But that wasn't the real truth. You see, Frank Baum was an actor. Well, he was a producer and a writer. He had a troupe of actors, and he rode the train around the country putting on plays. Mm. Not a very good uh, stable income. She knew I wouldn't approve. <sighs> well, that summer, Julia came to me and said she had a beau. Julia. She was like 31. We met him. His name was John C. Carpenter. I didn't like him. No. First of all, he, he was nine years younger than Julia, and every time he came to our house, the whiskey decanter went almost empty every time. I never saw the man without a glass in his hand. I didn't approve. And, and Julia said that John was going to do some experimental farming out in the Dakotas. And, well, he had some money, but not enough. But with her inheritance that she got from her grandmother's, uh, they could do it. I said, Julia, 
don't want to marry a farmer. And it's she said, Mother, I'm sick and tired of taking care of somebody else's house. I want to have my, my own home and my, my own children, and, and, and this is the only chance I'm going to get, and I want to take it. So she married John and went off to the Dakotas. Well, that emboldened Maud to come and tell us about Frank. She made us meet him and go to one of his plays, and he, he grew on us. He knew that she, uh, we knew that he was a, a good man, and even if he didn't have a stable income, and, and Maud was insistent. That's what you get when you raise an independent daughter. So they were married in our living room and went off on the train to perform in different cities. They sent me postcards. They had a wonderful year till Maud got pregnant. And Frank did the, the right thing. Uh, he uh, rented a house near us in New York and he got a job selling axle grease. He was on the road, and Maud was at home, and she, she did some sewing to help, embroidery and stuff to help out with their income, and things were pretty consistent, if not overly wealthy, but anyway, um, Frank was uh, a good husband, and he had this creative thing that he still had from being an actor. And he was loyal and um, true. He, he didn't go out at night and carouse. He sat in his hotel room and he wrote stories for his children. Um, short little stories, fairy tales, whatever. And he mailed them back to us. And during this time, Maud had four boys. Four boys. She wanted a girl so bad, but she had four boys and she had some complications. And the doctor said she couldn't have any more children. <sighs> but then Frank got itchy feet. He wanted to follow um, my son, who was already out west, and his brother-in-law, John, who was out west. And he wanted to go out west, too, and, and make his way. And he had an idea. He was going to open a store, N not a general store. He was going to open a, a store that sold luxury items to farmers. He called it Bomb's Bazaar. And we all moved, the four children, and they got a house. And it was good. The store kind of made its way. Frank gave out a lot of credit, and he charged a lot himself. But it was, it was doing OK. And the family settled in, and that's when Maud heard from her sister, Julia. Julia, she wanted her own home. She didn't even get a decent log cabin. James, that was her husband's name, James. Maybe I said John, I'm not sure. I forget these days. But James, he should have tried to be a regular farmer before he wanted to do ex experimental farming. He took out the worst piece of ground, all full of rocks and weeds and no trees. To build a log cabin, the logs had to be wagoned in. That was expensive. Julian's dream house turned out to be more of a hut than a home. But she managed to have a baby, a baby girl. I don't even know how it survived, because John or James. See, I didn't like the man. That's why I don't remember his name. He, he worked her like a farmhand, worked her out in the fields. She didn't get a moment's rest, but she had to do everything else and care for her child. <sighs> Any extra money they got went to alcohol. Well. Julia had a, a second baby, and her, her milk wasn't, wasn't nutritious, they said. Well, no wonder. 
she was afraid the baby was going to die. And so she wrote to Maud and, and asked her for help. And Maud and Frank immediately sent her enough train fare money so that she and the little girl and the baby could come to them. And Maud told me later when she opened the door, she didn't even recognize her sister. She was skin and bones, and her hair was gray, and her face was tanned and wrinkled. The little girl beside her was skin and bones and emaciated, and her hair was dirty, and her dress was awful. The little bundle in her arms. Maud took her right in. She put her sister to bed and the baby, and she called the doctor. They got a, a wet nurse for the baby and wouldn't let Julia even get out of bed. And that left Maud and the little girl together. At first, the little girl didn't talk. She, she was so shy, but Maud drew her out. She, she read her stories, and she had little tea parties for her. And she, of course, she washed her hair and braided it in pigtails, and she even made her a blue and white gingham dress. And, and the little girl, her name was Magdalena, uh, came out of herself, and the two became really, really good friends. And, and Maud started to get a little better, and the baby was, well, coming along, and they got a letter in the mail from James. And James said, Julia, I need you to come home. It's planning season, and I need your help. Maud said to Julia, don't go. Stay here. We have plenty of food, and, and we have room, and, and, and just stay here. Don't go back there. And Julia, being the Victorian girl she was, she said, he's my husband, and I have to go. And then Maud said, well, why don't you leave Magdalena here with us? You know we, we love her and, and, and we have food and she can go to school. We'll take such good care of her. Give her this chance. She has no chance at all out there. Just let her stay with us. And Julia, she said, I can't. I can't. I know, I know she'd be better off with you, but I can't leave her here. She's my only, my only joy out there. She's the reason I get up in the morning. If I didn't have her, I don't think I could go on. And so Maud said goodbye to her sister, Julia, got on the train with her baby and her daughter and went back. A few months later, the baby died. Maud was brokenhearted. <sighs> Make matters worse, my son, my son had a baby, baby girl too. Her name was Dorothy. She only lived six months. And Maud, that broke her heart. A baby girl and a family lost even started Maud on a little bit of a depression for a long time. And the store, Frank Bombs Bazaar, well, the drought came. Well, the farmers didn't have money for luxury items anymore. And Frank was up to his neck in debt door went under. And then he got the idea that he'd move his family to Chicago, where he got a job with a newspaper. And, and that suited him better, you know, because he was writing, and, and he liked that. And he, he kept writing some of his other little stories and things. And Maud, you know, she began to encourage him to maybe publish a little book of stories for children. He thought about it. And Julia, well, James gave up farming. 
he moved to the city. He got a job with an insurance company and things were better. Magdalena could go to school. Julia didn't have to work in the fields. However, Frank did not give up drinking and he died at an early age under a, a cloud of suspicion with the finances and the insurance company and he may have died by his own hand. The years went on. My husband passed away. I visited my daughters back and forth and still kept up with all my work. And then I didn't live to see it, but Frank's book got published. It was called The Wizard of Oz. Oh, it was a huge success. The family had money now. They built a beautiful home called Oz, Ozcourt. Ozgot? I don't remember. Anyway, they had enough money to go off with their children and tour Europe. Well, as I said, you know, Frank wasn't very good with handling money and stuff. He didn't do well with that either. Even with this windfall and success, when he passed away, Maud had to sell the rights to the Wizard of Oz. The family lost them. But she, she went on. She had the money that I left her and things were okay. And then Magdalena's daughter, I believe it was, went on to grow up get married and go to college. And she became the first senator in the state of South Dakota. Imagine that. There I was, up in heaven, celebrating because my legacy had finally happened. The moral of the story is, you never know who you're going to affect. You never know if your children will follow your path, but someone will. Thank you.